Okay. So because nobody else would step up and do one of these, I, I said, okay, sure. And then I, if I'm going to do it, I might as well do it on something fun. So this is a topic uh, that I've, I've researched a couple of times. Once when I first became a uh, dean of faculty and somebody said, well, you should send something out. So I looked into it a little bit, sent something out. And then a few years later, I sent something else out. And then I started sending something out every year. I haven't done it yet this year, but I probably will. Um, and it has to do with this topic of predatory journals and then associated editorial boards. And it all really began with bogus conferences that people got invitations to. And so um, and that's what I wanted to talk about and the dangers therein. Okay. What am I doing wrong? Okay. Ah, so the first problem is who is Will Robinson? As I discovered, it was a TV show from the 60s. Ooh, there we go. I cannot accept that course of action. I cannot accept that course of action. My computer is the best on earth. Does not compute. Does not compute. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. So, um, if you've ever read Robinson Crusoe, this is the space version of that. A, a family and their two kids in this evil Dr. Smith got marooned and the robot is the little boy's buddy and he keeps him out of trouble that Mr. S Dr. Smith keeps getting them involved with. Uh, so there's, that's the reference. Do. Yeah, I sh I sh you should teach me to do that. Okay, so this is the one I, I got. I get these every day. Um, uh, and, and some often multiples. This is the one that came on Monday. Um, and I'm going to tell you more about it later on. And then it all started for me uh, some years back. Okay, um, when you started getting, uh, and I think this probably happened, oh, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, you'd start getting invitations to go to meetings in China. And then they moved to Dubai, and now they've become much not, you know, more interesting places in Europe, and even in the United States. And Canada. Okay. A new low for me last was last year, when um, I got this invitation to be on an editorial board for a journal uh, called JSM Pediatric Surgery. Okay. So you get them and they have no relationship to what you do. And then uh, there's an admin person in medicine who is not on the faculty at all. And he's getting it now. So we're being inundated with it. Now, Okay, is there a way I can just, right? Oh, okay. Then um, what's been showing up, and this is about the third time in the New York Times, uh, many academics are eager to publish in worthless journals. And academics and schools they teach rely on publications and they, uh, you can see some of that and we'll talk about it. And, and so, you know, when the New, New York Times gets interested in it, this becomes part of the mainstream. And so it's a minefield out there. It, this is really dangerous stuff, guys. And you can go down a rabbit hole in a hurry, as I'll show you. Um, part of this is, is the explosion of uh, journals. Uh, so from 97 to 2012, this paper in Nature, there's a doubling in the number of journals. And it's predicted to just continue to rise unless something has caused it to slow that I'm not aware of. And so there's some people view this as a crisis. Um, it started in large part because the subscription rates started going up on the journals. 
and the page fees and everything else. And then uh, live, I remember this in Denver, uh, I was on committees to look at which journals we could quit subscribing to. And then the number of articles that came out was going up in an exponential rate. And then there are new journals, seems like there's a new one every other day. And then the publishers started getting a lot of journals and then they would sell packages to the library. And then open access uh, journals started to emerge. And uh, the, the, there's a lot of good things about ac open access journals. Um, higher citation rates, more exposure, developing country people can see what you're doing. So there's a lot, a lot of good things. But it, unfortunately, it's seen by some people as a gold rush. This is a great way to cash in. And anything nefarious almost always involves money. And so that's what you have to always be thinking about is where, what's the business model and how are they going to take my hard earned money? Now, um, the problem with open access is that the charges tend to be pretty high because they're relying on other sorts of revenue than say a journal for a society where the journal's being supported by your dues to that society. Um, there's concerns. I mean, let's say you're a really productive person you could end up paying, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars a year easy uh, for your publications, and that comes directly out of the same money you you, you pay for your experiments. And then, um, as we'll see in a minute, there's become huge concern about the quality. And then, then it moved into the area of just plain uh, spam, scams, and predatory journals. Now, um, so to start a journal from a point of view of a scammer, I need an idea a computer and a bank account. And this guy, Beal in Colorado, actually was keeping a list until recently of predatory publishers. And when he started in 2011 to when he quit just last spring, he'd already, you could see the exponential growth in, in, uh, in ones that are known to be uh, predatory. And there's a definition for that. And then um, the publishers themselves there, there started to be ones where they had many more um, uh, uh, journals. Uh, they exploit the open access thing for profit. They are corrupt. Uh, customers include people who are fooled as well as customers who are complicit. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about both of those. This is one of the most uh, infamous, it's called Omics. They have some 700 journals at last count and they are also in the conference uh, business as well. And it's, it's estimated that they uh, produce a nice, tidy little profit. Uh, this just shows the number of journals, and th these are the ones with 100 or more. Uh, one of the business models is sort of 10 to 99 journals in a single publisher, and you can see the numbers of articles are just, you know, there's really no signs of end at this point. Um, with these fake journals comes something I didn't know much about until I was working on this talk, is the whole the whole aspect of fake impact factors. Okay, because if I got a fake journal, I might as well have a fake impact factor, right? And um, so authors publish articles mistakenly believing that their stuff is in an impact factor journal. Um, the, of course, the journals are happy to advertise the fact that they're bogus. I'll show you an example of that. And then with well, the part I like is there are people who have set up companies that sell impact factor to other bogus predatory journals. All right, this is, this is the predators uh, feeding on the predators. And here's some of them. Uh, oops. Here's a whole, here's a big list of them. They're quite, pretty inventive. How about this one, global impact factor, the international impact factor services. And here are the number of journals they claim and then the method by which they calculate it is absolutely not described, although they say it's similar to the one that everyone thinks about. But, and then here are the processing fees and the ones that this person could find. So if you do 18,000 times 50, you know, it's an interesting business model. Um, and then who publishes in these journals and why? Um, this study, uh, which is often quoted, and there are three kinds of journals here, the typical predatory ones, open access, and then high quality, and then the percentages of, of where they're from, 
And in the predatory journals, it's, it's um, uh, Southern Asia, uh, China, I think is probably what we're thinking about here, uh, Middle East, and then a lot from Africa. And then we're not immune to it at all, okay? There are people here, uh, probably at this institution that are doing that, okay? Maybe they don't know what they're doing, and, and, and it's thought that they're most part young and inexperienced, and they're from developing countries. It's the major uh, customer for these guys. So why do it? Uh, we're all under pressure to get recognition in our field and, and um, have impact on our work. And if I'm a young person in, say, somewhere in Africa, you could see where you could fall into that. Uh, you know, the acceptance rate in legit journals is very low, and it may take you years to break in. Uh, and then to build your portfolio and do it in a hurry, one might be tempted to do this, okay? Now, I, I thought I'd stop here. A couple of years ago, I had a faculty member here who's since left from one of the clinical departments come see me about promotion. And what was what struck me and really bothered me a lot was they had a, a loan, they were clinicians, so, we don't often see a lot of papers, but they were on more editorial boards than they had published papers. So then I sort of had an oblique conversation about, you know, maybe you shouldn't be spending so much time. And, you know, there's this whole thing about predatory journals, and that was sort of an oblique conversation. But I think he had fallen prey to that. Now, the other reason that people do this is because these people are very flattering. I'll let you read this one. Um, it salutes you for your compendium of writings, which immensely helped the global society and their descendants understand and shed light on and about. Okay, your published manuscripts are evidence that you have innate immunity, I guess, ability and, and prodigies for, I mean, they are really nice. It's the only time I get uh, referred to as esteemed and honorable, and, and they're very nice to me. And of course, then I get interested. And uh, this this one's really pretty remarkable. Uh, well, how bad? How truly bad? Are, maybe they're just different grades of bad. Um, and so uh, the, they're they're defined here um, by Beale and other people. They're only in the b business. Let me put this down somewhere out of the way. Ooh, you know, put it way down here. Um, to collect money, uh, rapidly publish without part, yeah, that's if they even publish it, and they could be very misleading and they're basically spam. Then they have editorial boards that are made up. Um, they, they have, as I'll show you, limited of any peer review. Uh, there was an article in one of the papers in Canada that was really gotten nuts and pointed out in one of these journals, uh, they had a Nobel laureate who was dead on their editorial board. And I'll tell you another story about that in a second. Here's one, I like this one. This is the Journal of Current Research and Science. So that kind of covers everything, right? And then they have high standards. Is, followed, is following an instant policy on rejection, those papers with plagiarism rates of more than 40%. So if you're under 40%, you're good to go. Okay, that's a, that's a high quality journal. And then look at their, um, it's a bi-monthly. Uh, they have a global impact factor, not so good. I don't know what point no zero is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is. And then they have a universal impact factor. Whoa, okay. So yeah, that's that, I was really impressed with that one. Now here's an example. Um, this is the International Journal of Current Research, <laughs> another great title that covers everything. And now we have a nice research article, and it's ac uh, architecture in uh, wherever this place is, and it's by this nice person from Iran. And here's the abstract, reads right along. The problem with this paper is if you just read like the first sentence, and then if you go to Wikipedia, it reads word for word. Now, the question is, did he write the paper and put it into Wikipedia or the other way around? And, of course, you can verify that. You can kind of imagine what that might be. So the amount of plagiarism in these papers, when you do see them, it can be pretty astonishing. Now, um, the last time I did this a few years ago, 
there was this guy who wrote his paper in science. And what he did is he made up a fake paper. It's about cancer cells growing and then being treated with a, some drug. And he sent it off to two ty three types of journals. Um, well, two types, the Beals list, which are the known predatory ones, and then a bunch of open access journals. And then these ones are actually overlapping between the two. And uh, he, he sent it out to 304 journals. A bunch of them rejected it, mostly in the, obviously in the non beal list group. Even some of the beal list guys rejected it. And then um, it was accepted, and there was substantial peer review only in nine, uh, and no peer review at all. In fact, he, he, there were, his paper got accepted in, within 24 hours in several of, of the journals. And then he did something else that was kind of interesting. And that is he traced them by following uh, where they're being published in their bank account. And when this all started, it was actually, a lot of this was coming out of India and Africa, the, you know, the Nigerian print scam that was, I'm still getting those. Um, and it turned out that they had set up shop in Europe, but the, actually the money was flowing to India. And nowadays when you get these, at least I get them, they're almost always located in the United States. And so they're shell games. I actually went to one of them and tracked the building that was supposed to be in, in the California and found the directory for the building. And I don't see the, the publisher in the directory for the building. So I think it's probably not real. Um, here's a guy, this guy in the earth sciences did an interesting study. He, he uh, wrote this paper up and for those of you from Canada know that there's no, there is no desert in Canada. And so this is all made up. He submitted a completely incoherent paper featuring made up data and he sent it to 18 journals, eight responded quickly. And of course, all of them wanted a processing fee that would range from a thousand to five thousand okay. dollars. Um, this one is really astonishing and, I, and I'm sorry about the language, but this is what it was. Um, this guy uh, following on somebody who made this abstract up for a fake uh, conference made this into a complete paper that was 10 pages. This is the abstract for it. That's the name of it. Um, and then sent it out for publication uh, to this journal. And they accepted the paper uh, and an anonymous reviewer rated it as excellent. And he wanted 150 bucks to publish it. And it had figures in it. And so here's one of those figures. You can see that it, <laughs> some people, I guess in some aspects of computer technology, they think that's an advancement. Um, well, this one, this one came out uh, in Nature. I think this is Nature. Yeah, nature. Um, a year ago, and this was a clever sting. Uh, some people together with their uh, colleagues in Poland created a fake uh, professor, Parsons associate professor. They created um, a CV, they created a Facebook page apparently and some other things, very elaborate. And uh, here she is. Her name is Anna Suquist, and uh, she's from Poland, and she doesn't exist. And it turns out that O S C Z U S T in Polish means fraud. And so they sent her credentials out to a whole bunch of journals. And the story, what happened next, is unbelievable. She was accepted for editorial board, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this was published a year ago. And I just for the fun of it, I went on the website and I found one journal where she's still listed as a editor. So it, it, it's a it's a funny read if you're into that. Um, and then on top of it, there's the conferences. Um, one of the problems we have in our promotion system is you've got to have a national international reputation and you get that by being invited to conferences. And of course there's legitimate ones, you know, think of the Gordon conference or whatnot. And then there are predatory ones that are purely for profit, poorly organized, no peer review, nothing. Uh, and worse than that, you pay the fee, you submit an abstract, you purchase a 
airplane ticket, you book the hotel, and then when you actually get there, you discover there is no conference or it got canceled somewhere and you weren't informed of that. Um, this is a notice from the University of Toronto that in one of their buildings associated with the university, a fake conference was supposed to be occurring and they were just letting the people know about that. So how do I spot it? Um, well, they, you got, you, there's a lot of things. Uh, they, they, and they're, they're getting clever, more and more clever about it. Sometimes th there's a thing called hijacking where a name of the journal is actually similar to the real one. Um, they have academics as editorial boards and there's, but a lot of this is kind of hard to find. Um, this is actually better. Um, there, there's things like the indexing is wrong, the metrics are wrong. Uh, but the biggest way to pick it out is meaningless words, things that don't make sense, and really, really bad English. Uh, but again, they're getting better. So you got to kind of watch. How do you avoid them? Um, you assess the editorial journal. You uh, look at the contact information. You check and see if they have a, this number, but, you know, they can be faking that. You can look them up. There used to be this Beals list. He took his list down because he got sued by the Omics people. And then there's um, my best advice is when in doubt, uh, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. If it if something looks and feels bad, it probably is. And if doubt, ask your PI colleagues. And if you can't ask any of those, go talk to the librarians. They'll help you with it. Right, this says, I smells, the, this deal smells fishy. Where do I sign? Okay. Uh, uh, now it can impact you badly, permanent stain. Um, there was a, something I read recently where quite a number, oh, it's, it's out of British Columbia. There was a university in the economics department. Some guy had got done an analysis. Turned out that most of the people in that department had published at least one. And there have been a number of instances where people were padding their CVs for promotion with way too many of these. Uh, and, and so it's, it's uh, something I think is going to get a lot more press as this comes out. Uh, well, you say, Charlie, I just ignore them. Yeah, but how do you know that a co-author of yours didn't take some work you collaborated and stick it in one of those joints? And then if you're hiring somebody, do, do I go through their CV and check all their papers? No. Um, what about your grad students or other trainees, particularly after they leave you? And I'll give you an example of that. And then, um, and then sometimes you may pick up a paper like that just in your searches, particularly if you use something like Google Scholar. So let's go back to this, this one. Um, how do I know this isn't, how do I know this is bogus? Well, Greetings. Hope you are doing well. Hmm. All right, that's nice of them. We request you to submit the manuscript as an attachment to an email. That seems kind of strange. So then when I, um, considering you as a potential researcher, I'm a potential researcher? Okay, we would like to take this opportunity, and they always have a fairly tight window, so that you don't, they don't want you thinking too much. But if you click on here, this is what you get. Whoa, this is pretty nice. Lots of colors, everything else. So I looked this guy, this publisher up, and they're known to be bogus. I looked at the editor in chief. That's a real person. The guy's at, uh, he's in the Pulmonary Division at UCLA. The editorial board is interesting. It's got mostly assistant associate uh, professors, most of them from a lot of UCLA. And right at the bottom of the very last one is somebody we trained here. So I'm going to have to speak to her about that. And then I went and looked at the current issue and then the archive. It looks like they've actually only published about four papers. And then when I ser was searching for this, I realized they've been after me for several years to publish it there. Okay. And then if we read this, the English again uh, is not that great. Uh, what might be the... Um... Hang on a second. I'm almost done. Uh, they're going to rip you off, and they, they this could have huge career uh, impact, and so that's my final side. Beware. Sorry. Now, <laughs> I just I guess I've always assumed that the people on the other side are not reputable 
upstanding people and you just kind of threw a wrench into that thinking you know you said hey, I, you know there's people at ucla that are in fine standing somebody that left here well, the question, standing, and they're on the editorial board how did they get sucked into this yeah uh, so that's the the issue and if they you read the paper you? if you read that article about the fake editor you'll get some ideas about why that might be because some of these journals actually offer to share the profits of their scam the question that would be interesting to do not sure i'm up to doing it is i could call that guy and ask him what's going on here is is this real and he may tell me they took my because they go to the website take all your stuff yeah. from the website and then you say hey take that down and where is they and who how do you get a hold of them? So that's actually why I want to talk to our trainee to find out she was a person we trained here many years ago and who's at Emory and call her up and say, do you know you're on this thing? And how did that happen? My guess is she may not know. So I got a, an invitation this last year for what looked semi-interesting meeting, but as I dug into it, I, I realized it was probably bogus. But I looked at who are the organizers. Do I know any of the names? Like this was about COPD, chronic pneumonia, and most of the people I didn't know, so that's not a good sign. But I saw somebody I did who was here at Penn and then had moved to Rutgers a couple of years ago, and he's a friend of mine. So I wrote him a little email and said, "Is this real? Is this bullshit?" And uncharacteristically of him, I never heard back. So I'll see him now in June, May at our meetings. I assume, and if I do, I'm going to say, hey, what the hell is going to be any piece that kind of guy I can give him some shit about? And if, is he complicit? He could be. I don't know. But people get hijacked, and so you can't assume. Right. Okay. Now, one of them that I got, I actually researched one of the people. It was a, a university in Italy I'd never heard of. Turned out the university was real. But when I ran a search of this guy on their website, nothing comes up. So maybe he's really there. We had a speaker in medicine a few, about a month ago, who gave a most interesting talk. And I'm a very open-minded person. I like to think, and I actually like kooky people. This guy was very kooky. And but he had like a paper in Nature and another one in Science or something like that. I don't know about that. So I started researching him and I quickly figured out he didn't have a PhD. He was in graduate school. Uh, he, I think he was the, the guy doing the field work for them in Africa. That was real. But uh, he, he was clearly running behind in the skirts of some other people. And, and his story is probably a very interesting one, I suspect. But, you know, here he is at medical grand rounds and you think he's some professor for somewhere <laughs> but when you dig into him you find out that does uh pubmed help address this at all with their search engine will yeah. you see the impact factor journals rise to the top and everything else to well here we have an editor here i mean he could make uh, but that's what i would so what i've done in a few cases is and just kind of doing this research is I'll take that article that they claim is published and then see do those people actually exist using PubMed and are they publishing in that sphere? And then it's quite, it's not unlikely that they could have lifted the entire paper out of a legit journal and then just republished it. In there. There's actually kind of a famous case about a guy who used to do that back in the day. So it's, uh, and we're getting them every day. I don't know, how many do you get a day? I would say between five and 10. Yeah. Um, I just think, well, I just, it, oh, yeah. it's usually, you know, it, it would say, dear Taj's DJ, Taj's DJ, you know, have my initials and name like several times. That's a, a giveaway immediately for me. And it's always, like you said, typically to me journals that I completely irrelevant to them. Right. Because you know in your field what the top 10, 20 journals are, just like you do. 
I got invited yesterday to be an editor in the Journal of Midwifery. <laughs> <laughs> they're on a roll. A lot of they're after a lot of people. Did you get that one? Too? Yeah, I've, I, no, but I have in the past. So, so what can publishers do actually to protect you from that? Because for me, it really spiked after the last book chapter that we published. I got like at least twice the amount of these emails per day. Now. Yeah. So I don't know if the publishers well, quit publishing in good journals. That would be your. <laughs> no, if they could, because it seems to be easy for them to get our email addresses. Yeah. Yeah, they, that's how they get it. So I got one the other day. It's it's addressed to Dr. Urban and Dr. Pointer. And then they're, they're very flattering about an editorial we wrote. Now we want that, now they want the paper. Uh, most of these, all you have to do is, if it's, you know, it's like, it's like the phone calls. If it's not somebody you know, you just go delete. Yeah. Um, what's the, I don't want to say what's the alternative, but I do, but I do want to say, what if I wanted to, to be nice? And what if there was an upcoming journal that I just really honestly didn't know about much? And I wanted to say, hey, they need a review. I'd love to support you and write something for you. It's all open access. It doesn't take too much of my time. You know, it's not a huge win for me, but for the journal, it's big. Um, how do you spot those? The legitimate, low level <laughs> research journals that are just trying yeah, to. Yeah, so I'll give you an example of that. Jovi. This Journal of Video Online Education is what it's called. When it first came out, I thought it was a total predatory journal. And, you know, they were really chasing it when they first came out. Uh, and I, and I, I think it's hard to know. Uh, I, I can't ask any of my colleagues, because this is a new format kind of a thing, they're not going to know. Um, I'd probably resort to talking to one of the librarians, frankly. Yeah, because I mean, I look at the way that eLife started, yeah. right? And the reason why eLife took off so easily so fast was because it had huge names behind it. Yeah. Right? And that was the only way that it was able to gain legitimacy. Well, yeah, why do you think they took a dead Nobel laureate and put it on their end? <laughs> they also don't, you don't have to pay them and they're not going to give you a hard time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think it's just, you know, like everything in life nowadays, you just got to be careful. Now, you, you, you said some things that I'm going to take umbrage with or, or disagree with you. Sure. One of them is, well, it's not that hard to write this thing. Uh, yeah, it is actually. That, that, it takes a lot of effort to write anything. I mean, when people ask me to do things, I say, well, the first thing I ask is, does it involve complete sentences? Mm -hmm. If it does, then I start looking at it pretty carefully. It means me flapping my mouth, that's easy. But if I gotta sit and write, that's a lot of work, for me anyway. And so what, how do you wanna spend your time? It, I mean, these are all judgment calls. It's, it's rhetorical questions. So I don't, and I don't know the end. Everybody has to come to it. It's just that you could see how you could fall prey to these real quick if you're not, you know, uh, imagine you're, well, let's just imagine you're a, a young, upcoming, struggling uh, uh, academic and athlete. And, you know, or Korea, where they, they, they put a lot of, of uh, pressure on the faculty to publish. Um, I have friends at the Imperial College in London. And the, the, the expectations for, for the faculty there to publish is staggering. I mean, they expect you to put a paper into like science, cell night major in science, that, that kind of level every other year. That's a high mark. They used to, and they, there was a time when, I think it's the Chinese, correct me guys if I'm wrong, and I know Imperial College, they would not count any publication that wasn't in a journal with an impact factor greater than five. Because I was talking to a colleague of mine there and I said, well, what about the Journal of Applied Physiology? It's a very good journal. Has some other interesting metrics that are kind of unusual, uh, but it's not five. And he says, I can't, Charlie, I can't put my, I can't send my paper, at least not at the first, which I think is outrageous. But that's, you know, you, 
the guys up at the top make the rules, and you've got to you deal with it one way or the other. I think it's actually three now, and because at plus one, when plus one's impact factor right. went to three, we had a 150% increase yep. in the number of submissions from yep. China the next year. Yeah, so mm -hmm. China is three. <coughs> Imperial at one time was five, and now it's like you've got to publish something. I think somebody told me it's impact factor greater than 17, but it's only every other, but it's only every other <coughs> year. Gosh. Most papers I know that are at that level are five years of work. That's where Doug's reproducibility crisis comes from. I mean, you make an incentive like that, you're encouraging. Well, you're you, encouraging. Got, you guys know the data. There's an absolute strong correlation between retraction rates and impact factor. Hmm. It tells you I mean, it's tightly correlated. There used to be a chain of command where, I mean, chain of command is not the right word, but you, you the reviewers would, their you know, review request would get sent to professors. And then they would walk out into the lab and pawn it off on their students. And it seems like now the requests are coming straight through to the students. And isn't that automatically fishy? It's like, hold on, just go through the person that's. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I Definitely. can't tell you how many reviews I've written for. You know, I, have, I, I haven't actually. <laughs> reviewed, but even as a grad student, I was. Yeah. I was really? Yeah. yeah. See, this is one of the reasons I wanted to do these things. <laughs> but so never. we could talk about stuff. I didn't know that. In that, in that huge huge lab, the actual PI cannot write the reviews. They don't have time. They're on the end No, no, no. I get that part. But, <laughs> but the initial but the initial invitation is coming to you guys. No, I mean from from the box, right? Oh, from right? the box. Yeah, yeah. Like they don't have the time. They're on like five minutes for board. And I'm just saying what you know, can't we just get rid of all any and all invitations that go straight to people that aren't professors? Uh -oh. Well, is, is there a legit? No, 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 no. Now we get. Now we got to get our facts straight. Okay. Are these requests for you to review a paper coming from the journal itself or from your PI? Oh well, the only ones I've ever participated in, in, in have come directly from my PI. Oh, so, but, you know, but from the journal have, to yeah, PI. I have to request from the journal, sure. um, from journals that are non-reputable. Right. Okay. So. What I'm referring to is like is like you're overextending, right? The more the more pressure you have on PIs to be part of a ton of different editorial right. boards, the more pressure gets put on the PI. Therefore, the PI feels the need to disseminate the papers to other people in the lab, right? Oh no! You know what I mean, like, the PI is wants to share the educational process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is a huge ethical issue here. Just say it. And I'll leave it to my learned colleagues to expound on that. What do you think of that? I mean, as an editor, yeah. I send out uh, manuscripts for review. It's, um, and Gary will speak about this, I'm sure, as well. For me, it's become more and more difficult to get people to accept. Talk to people, they don't have time. So if I see someone and, you know, I'll look at the manuscript, and if it's a Topic I'm not incredibly familiar with. I'll go into PubMed and I'll look up who's doing good work in that area, and then I'll look them up. And if they have papers themselves in Cell Science and Nature, I don't even ask because I know they won't review it. Or just, they, they're not interested. But then comes the issue. Well, then you start to get deeper down into PubMed. You find some other people doing interesting work. And to your point, sometimes I don't know them, and I don't know potentially if it's a student. Or the professor oh. who right. you are sending an email to because there's no you can't tell. Listed. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. the, it's and not like a color code. And if it's not my field, I may not know um, who that is. So well, what about the ethics of a of a PI handing a review over to a student to do? Um, I think if they disclose that, and if I ask a professor to to do it and they email back and say, I don't really have time, but I've got an advanced student in the lab who's doing all the work and knows all the literature. You know, I'm okay with that. If they disclose it, if they take it and pass it off as their own review, right. I don't think that's ethical. And why and why is that not ethical? They object. Plagiarism. Yeah. It's an intellectual property issue. Yes, yeah, sort of, but I mean, it's 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 a gray zone. It's it, 
definitely a gray zone. I'm just but, saying we're talking about a gray zone, so yeah. I might as well be honest with. Well, I, so why do you think that's a gray zone? I mean, if, if I've asked someone to review it and I get a review back, I expect this from them that it was done by a student and I wasn't informed of that. Is. I'd say that's unethical. Okay. I mean, myself. That, All right. As, as you said, you're passing off. What are there? Else's words are there? In, 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 in the instructions to uh, the reviewer or in the instructions on the journal's website, does it say anything about that? Yeah, most of them do. Yeah. Okay. They say if you, if you involve anybody else in the review, you need to disclose. That's what I thought, but I thought I'd ask you guys, yeah. and I wanted to do it in a more of a Socratic lecture. Get you think about it. I mean, these are the kinds of ethical dilemmas you're always going to be faced with. and. When it comes to publishing and authorship, they're some of the worst. Just but, on the other side of that, I always involve students and right. postdocs in my lab in review. I don't, of course. I don't have because I think it's important. I actually do think it's an important experience. part of the training. Right. It's, it's kind of open oh, yeah. But I would never have them write it and me not and have oh, them right. yeah, 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 I'm not, not saying that's happened, over. It, yeah. But I'm saying like like when when you're a student or postdoc and you're doing both, and in some big labs, I mean. PI cannot possibly review every single one. Uh, yeah. Well, well actually, actually, I shouldn't accept to review. Well, I don't know about that. You know, but, but I'm just saying, I'm saying, I see a really huge lab where, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, how are you, like you're saying, where's the gray area? If you're on so many editorial boards, right, you're going to have to reject a ton of papers because you don't have the time to do them. If you don't reject them, you're just, just, you recuse yourself from reviewing. Sure. Sure, sure. Yeah, just an yeah. interesting number at, at PLOS, it takes 19 requests wow. to get one reviewer to wow. say Are you so, kidding me? I'm not at all surprised. And that's a, that's a well-known journal. Yeah. So what would be interesting is to go, I mean, you know, like, I, I happen to know the editor of the New England Journal. I bet he gets most of the people who get asked to review, review for that. But then you go to, in, in your field, if I go to a journal in pulmonary that's down there, I mean, you know, number 10, number 15. I bet you it's even higher than 19. So, and then I always know, <laughs> what I notice is every time I publish a paper, I start getting requests from that journal. And they just boom, 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 boom. Or the worst thing is I go to the meetings and I see the editors of the editorial board members and Always the next day, the next week after I get back, I, I, I get a half a dozen requests to review. The, um, you know, involving people in the lab in, in reviews, um, I actually think it takes more time to tell you the truth to do yeah. that just right there. Oh, well. so, sure. so I think it, it really is a training opportunity and it's, it's actually wonderful to watch students and postdocs who haven't done that by the time they leave your lab. They really do know how to focus on the important things yeah. and and give a constructive review. But so I, as long as you don't pass it off as your own work, I, I don't think it's gray zone at all. And I don't think you think that's gray zone, right? It's, I mean, if you if you get asked to review a paper and you involve people in the lab in it, but you're overseeing the whole thing, you're sort of using their input to craft a better review. There's nothing wrong. No, with that's that. very different. I, I thought you yeah, but, but, but let's go to review and then you submitted right, that. That's yeah. But I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you another viewpoint. You send me a request to review. And I know that if I ask you if I involve one of the students, you'll say yes. So I'll just involve them anyway. Now, the, the, the tricky piece is that when they're done with that review, I got to look it over again. And, and nine times out of 10, I'll probably change it and modify it. And then I send and I just don't tell you because I got better. You know, it's too much waiting around for you to tell me, and I don't want to slow your process down. But, but it, again, it's and, and I can see some. I mean, the peer review system has come under fire off and on my entire career, one way or the other. And everybody squawks about it because there's some case that there was a recent one. Oh, I think it was, was it China. Well, there's a huge fraud thing going on about, uh, yeah, I was talking about it in the, yes. yeah, remember I was talking about it in the misconduct thing. Yeah. There was some scam going on where people were reviewing each other's articles. And, yeah, it was a, it was horrible. And then the, the thing is then there's a big blow up. Well, I don't know about the review thing. And then after a while, so, okay, great. So it's broken, maybe. Uh, well, how would you do it better? 
Yeah. Okay, give it to Robbie the robot, let him try. So, well, maybe with artificial intelligence. But yeah, it's okay, so it's a system that's got problems and we just have to be watchful for it. But I, the thing I wanted to talk about is that I've seen people go down this rabbit hole with these things and I wanted to make sure that we had a, a, a learned clientele here. Charlie, a lot of societies have their own journals, right. but for those that don't, do they issue any recommendations for their membership on where to and where not to publish or to review? Well, I, don't, I, I think or an institution like uh, university, I know we have academic freedom, so we can't really say you can't do this, but well, um, I think a lot of people fall prey to it. That's why they're predatory. Yeah, okay, that's a little tougher. Um, it seems to me that if you're in a discipline on whatever it is, cancer or lung disease in my case, or bacteriology or genetics or whatever, you kind of know the journals. But when you don't know, you research. And I usually research them based on looking for papers of a similar topic. But at my tender age, I kind of know all the journals. But once in a while, a new one pops up like plus one, but for the most part, they're the ones you know. And then when you get into these journals you don't know, then it seems to be you gotta look into it. Um, Charlie, if I could recommend, there's a website called uh, Think, Check, Submit. That's the one I was thinking about, yeah. And it just, it, the, the sort of tips that Charlie posted about, you know, looking for bad language and checking editors, um, it's nicely laid out there and it's a, it's a very, so if you're ever sort of wondering, you could just go to that website and see, see which box it checks off. And I think it's probably more useful than a disciplinary thing because a disciplinary thing is by definition fragmented and we all submit outside our own discipline now. So I, got a, I got a question for you that if you get a call at home and it's someone trying to scam you, do you, are you polite to them and tell them no thank you or do you just hang up? So while I've been in here, I got a request to review a journal from a predatory <laughs> uh, paper exactly on what I do. It's perfect, but it's from a predatory journal. Should I give them the respect of not accepting and so I'm back into their system or do you just ignore it? Personally, I just ignore yeah. it. I wouldn't engage at all. Yeah, what I was doing for a while just because of my uh, sense of humor is I'd get these these requests for the bogus conferences when they first started. And I'd say, I'd be delighted to come. Just be aware that I have a speaker fee of $10,000 in first class airfare and all expenses. And up front. Up front. Yeah. I'm being yeah. up front about it, right? No, you need the money up front. Oh, yeah. Well, I had thought of that. <laughs> nice touch. <laughs> oh. And I will, take, I will take money orders. <laughs> you know, but I was just like, yeah, you don't hear anything back. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, or you get the bogus call and you scream in the phone, you know, so that their hearing goes. I've heard people do it. I mean, you just ignore it. John, could I just make sure one there that, that there wasn't one misimpression here, and it was really useful. I learned uh, a bunch of stuff here today, but um, I just want to make sure that we don't conflate open access with predatory journals because oh. they're two completely different, different things. Open access has enabled the growth right. of predatory journals, but there are, uh, you know, if you're talking eLife or you're talking Nature Communications or you're talking the PLOS journals, right. these are totally legitimate journals. And I personally believe that the open access model is a better way to publish than the subscription based either. model. Yeah. Um, and they do get tarred with the same feather sometimes, including in that Bohannon article that you. Uh, yeah. Actually, that Bohannon article that, that Charlie presented where the guy wrote the fake article and sent it out to all of these journals. I mean, they, he did choose to send it to the, article, to the journals on the Beals list, which are by definition the bad journals to start with. And it did get accepted into a bunch of journals that uh, it shouldn't have. It got rejected from a bunch. Thank God PLOS rejected that article when it came to PLOS. But um, it did get accepted into a bunch of journals. But then the conclusion of the Bohannon article was, open access journals are predatory. That was the conclusion of this oh, article. Yeah. And the beautiful thing, the ironic thing was it was published in science, that was published in science. 
So it was lacking the control, as articles in science often are, which was to send those same articles to, to subscription-based journals and see how many times oh, they yeah, yeah. If they wanted, if he wanted to conclude it was an open access problem. And the second ironic thing about that is it came one issue after science published the article on uh, arsenic as a basis of life in these halophilic bacteria, which turned out to be completely bogus and most attractive. So I just want to make I want to make clear that everybody understands that those are two separate things. And sometimes there's a call because of this problem, it's a real problem, that to, to abandon open access as a model. And to me, that's kind of like saying, since we get these Nigerian print scandals, we should all stop using the internet. Right. So it's all it's all about it's all about educated users. It's buyer beware. And so I went to a seminar recently, and um, it was on a topic that I know a little bit about, but not a lot. And uh, the person was new to me, and and um, showed data that had gone into three publications that were in open access, and I hadn't heard of them. So in the back of the room, I'm sitting there running it. And uh, the one journal was a nature publication group, but it had a, uh, it had a, a, a name, Scientific Reports. This is the gal in my name. I'd never heard of that journal. And it had sort of a spippy looking thing in it. Hmm. And so I thought, well, let's look it up because I'm preparing for this. Oh, it's a nature thing, so I guess it's okay. Uh, Hey, it's got to be great, right? But it's just something I didn't know. So, so can, I tell, can I tell you a little history of scientific reports? This is sort of interesting. Yeah. When when PLOS One launched uh, a journal, uh, the principles of which were the paper would be accepted if the science was sound. It didn't matter how sexy it was. Right. And, and it would be reviewed for soundness of science and do the conclusions follow from the data. Right. Nothing about sexiness. The Nature Publishing Group every issue they were calling it unpeer-reviewed science and you know a waste of taxpayers money oh. but then when class one took off and became the largest journal in biomedical science nature launched their own journal scientific reports but they didn't have the guts to put nature in the title they called it scientific reports because they were still they didn't want to be tainted and now scientific reports actually has overtaken plus one as the biggest mega journal and so yeah scientific reports is a perfectly legitimate yeah. nature journal that just publishes using this different model that they don't care about sexiness. So right. it's it's all about the money, right? And it's all about the money. And the same thing with open access. I mean, I consider a different type of predatory publishing, a journal like, like Cell that charges $5,200 for their version of open access, when I can tell you it costs them about $600 to publish those papers. Right. So they're using their name Cell to make a profit. You know, Cell is, Cell is an Elsevier title now, and Elsevier as a publishing company has made profits of 33% or more for the last 50 yeah, years. Yeah, Elsevier has come under some severe criticisms. They make a billion dollars in profit, Elsevier. So there's, I think, that how you right. find predatory. And, and so, anyways. So to go back to something Matt said, um, American Thoracic Society, which publishes three journals, they have a limited budget to do that because they get, you know, that there's cost to doing it, and then they get the money from subscriptions, and then they get them, and most of that comes from from the libraries. You think it's from the members of the society? They get actually most of it from libraries, and then um, you know their page charges and all that. But what they do, those societies limit the number of pages that journal can publish every year because that's all they can afford. And, and, and so, you know, then they, so then what they do is they add another, they added one journal and then they added a third journal because the business was there. But they got to balance their books too. So, so, some of them are out for pure profit and they don't care how the hell they get it, like the ones we're talking about here. There's others that they still got to stay in business, so they got to make, make it work. Publishing in a society journal costs on average something like 40% what it costs to publish in a journal of a commercial based publisher like Elsevier in Nature. So, yeah, the societies generally do good things with. Uh, yeah, they, they, it's subsidized heavily. So, so. 
So it's, you know, this is buyer beware. I think, it, you know, be yeah. careful. Thank you for letting me make that point. No, no, it's, it's a good one because uh, well, I heard eLife mentioned, and it's like mentioning <laughs> eLife in the same breath as. No, 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 no. I wasn't. I was. What I was trying to get at was like eLife is a very, very upstanding journal, and but at its inception, it had really high level scientists backing it from the beginning, intentionally publishing in eLife. You know, to say, hey, this is like a good thing. This is a yeah, really I'm sorry. Thing. I understood that's what you meant. You're so, absolutely right about I mean, that. But. I mean, and, it, and it's what's so hard. There was something new. You're like, yeah. I don't know. But you know, the other thing that happened, there was a journal that I was uh, involved with, with a society that my previous chair got me involved. And, it, and back in the day, it was, it was a great journal. They had, you know, had a, you know, Nobel Prizes and winners writing in it and stuff. By the time I got involved with the society and started looking at this journal, it was terrible. It really was bad. And it should go away. And yet it... So there's, there's... That's why you just have to investigate and you, you you put a lot of work into the science that you do and it doesn't take that much more i did see one search engine maybe to get to your question matt there was something and i can't remember the name of it now where you take the abstract of what you're writing you put it in there and then they'll give you a list of journals i don't know that seemed to me kind of this be something i'd probably go talk to one of the librarians about Beale's list used to be the way to do it, yep. but um, as Charlie said, the University, of, Col University of Colorado got skittish and they Yeah, yeah. He was uh, he was he was getting sued by the omics guys, and then there's this Frontiers, which I always thought looked a little dodgy to me. Owned by Nature Publishing. Oh, is it? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and don't forget actually we keep saying nature publishing, but nature's actually owned by spring now. Nature's owned by spring. Okay. So what we're seeing is these huge agglomerations now. Kind of sounds like the, the the pubs in England where they all got gobbled up by. Yeah, it's the way, well, like you know, so you buy and sell press, and yeah. spring or buy in nature. Yeah. And there's plenty of crap published in the New England Journal of Science and Nature. Nature's prone to it. All right, guys, thanks for coming. And shall we? I, I got an opening next month, so if anybody wants to do something on something. Let's invite the Journal of Midwifery Editorial Board. <laughs> oh, I think, I think that's going to be your high water mark in your career. I thought pediatric surgery, but I think I'd much rather be a midwifery. I should join it just so you have to see that on my CV. I think you bring so. review my promotion. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to run into this gal we trained and find out what the story is there. Yeah, it would be interesting to know him. You know, if you go to that journal, Matt, yeah, go all the way to the bottom of that editorial board. There she was. Is there a picture of her? No. Is it really they have a picture, or they just have? Yeah. You're all done, right? Okay. Yeah, we we we'd be done. Okay. Are not publishing? I mean, my knowledge of other fields is limited.